All right, welcome. So uh, just wanted to give you a quick little slideshow about witchcraft and magic in the 16th and 17th century and take a look at its decline. So here we have a couple of images. We have in the top left, we have the stereotypical witch, the old woman, and she's spooning out something, something unwholesome, no doubt, to these strange little animals. They look kind of like cats or toads. We're not sure what. And those are the witch's familiars. Those are the devil appearing in the form of an animal that the witch would supposedly keep by her, mostly her side, and uh, use their powers when she's doing her evil work. The central picture shows a witch catcher, Matthew Hopkins. This is uh, English, obviously, from the language. Um, this is around the year 1650. And here you have the two seated women are witches, accused witches, and all those strange animals with the, the great names, Sack and Sugar, the name of the rabbit, Vinegar Tom, which is, I'm not sure what that is. It looks like a dog with horns. I don't know quite what it is. Anyway, those are the witches' familiars, and there's Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder, who's discovered them. And then on the right, we see, of course, what happens to the witches. Uh, the witches are executed, and in this case, horribly burned alive here to punish them for their crimes. So I wanted to start with the medieval worldview, the old worldview of witchcraft and supernatural. And pretty much everybody believes in this. Uh, it's not simply poor people or illiterate people, uh, people at all levels of society, kings and queens and popes. Uh, they all believe in magic and astrology. You have powerful leaders having uh, court astrologers, and they consult these court astrologers before they make major decisions. And again, a pretty widespread belief in the supernatural. But you do have a distinction between what they called natural magic versus magic that comes from Satan. Natural magic is, um, well, an example of it would be uh, magnets, um, something that has a property that can't be really fully explained um, but it clearly springs from nature, and uh, so that's considered okay, that's considered acceptable. And then there's satanic magic, which is malicious in nature and springs from Satan and obviously involves harming other people physically or spiritually. And again, educated people at this time period, they do believe that witches are real, they look to the Bible, they can see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament references to witches. And of course, these references make note that you should not suffer a witch to live. And so it's taken as a very serious duty to hunt down and, and execute witches as agents of Satan who are trying to undo God's work here in this world. And, you know, people believe that, uh, that for whatever reasons, God allowed Satan to act in this way in the world to test us and, and to, um, to try and, for whatever God's reasons are, to try and deceive us so that we can um, have to always be on watch against witches. But uh, there is this idea in the Middle Ages into the Renaissance that there are these so-called white witches, and these are the ones who make use of natural magic. And so uh, these are people um, in the days before a modern police force, in the days before any kind of newspapers that you could publish ads in. If you are missing an object, if uh, a child has wandered off, you don't know where the child is, if you believe something's been stolen from you, uh, or if there's a murder and you have several suspects, all of those are cases where you might go to your local white witch. Um, other names for the white witches were cunning women. The root word cunning comes from ken, which means knowledge or knowledge. Um, or uh, they're white witches, they're cunning women, or wise women, they're also sometimes called. And they would use these natural magic to items and, and manipulate natural magic to try and achieve their aims. So one thing, for example, that you would do is, is if you brought a, uh, a corpse into the presence of the murderer, uh, even if the corpse had been dead for a long time, if it was in the presence of the murderer, it might start to bleed again thus betraying the murderer's presence or witches would do uh, they would have something called the sieve and the shears they would have a sieve kind of like a colander and shears were these big scissors 
and they would kind of spin the, the sieve on the shears and ask questions and kind of like Ouija board kind of stuff um, that was believed to be acceptable. So you would find lost objects or have a white witch make a, a charm for you um, to try and protect you from the plague or, or some other mishap. And this was generally considered okay. However, once we get into the Reformation, um, the religious conflict kind of sharpens people's awareness of uh, Satan working in the world. And people begin to feel that maybe these white witches aren't so uh, benevolent after all. In fact, maybe these are just the most subtle of Satan's works because they appear to be doing good physically, but in fact they're harming your soul, which is much worse than a satanic witch, which is clearly uh, someone who's out to, to get you. Um, and easily identified as being from Satan. In addition to witches, um, there's a few other things here. Just to quickly talk about, uh, there is a, an idea that there are ghosts. Um, if you're familiar with Shakespeare's play about Hamlet, which actually he didn't come up with a plot, it's an older plot, but uh, in any case, Hamlet, his father has been murdered, uh, he believes, because his father's ghost appears before him and says, that he's been murdered and, and uh, Hamlet's uncle has done this. And the big problem for Hamlet is whether the ghost is really the shade of his father come to, to warn him and, and also to have him act as uh, an agent of vengeance or whether the ghost is actually a satanic spirit that's come to deceive him and cause him to murder an innocent man and, and doom his soul to hell. Um, so people did believe in ghosts. However, again, the, the, in the Protestant Reformation, this starts to change because the Protestants say, well, you know, the soul either goes to heaven or hell. There's no in-between, there's no purgatory, and it gets a little tricky. How do you get these souls wandering around the earth if we believe that they've only gone to one destination or the other? Um, there's also belief in other supernatural creatures. One of the most interesting is the idea of vampires, and uh, not so much the modern idea of vampires that we have of people drinking blood, but something a little bit different. Um, the, the, if you go to the hyperlink that I've got, oh, it's not a hyperlink. If you go to the, the, the link that I've got here, a um, really interesting story about a skull of a woman found in Venice with a brick shoved into her mouth. Um, there was the idea in the Renaissance, in the 16th century, there was the idea that vampires would uh, spread the plague uh, rather than drinking blood, and that one way to stop them would be to dig up the body and shove a brick in its mouth. Um, so kind of an interesting take on things, not not the modern take, um, certainly not the sparkly vampires that we see in modern pop culture, but uh, really seen as kind of horrific. And there were actually New England vampire scares in the 17th and 18th century, too, that are kind of interesting if you want to dig into that. But there is a sense that we're surrounded by the supernatural, by ghosts and goblins and things like that. But this does start to decline in the 16th and 17th century, but uh, there's kind of this last hurrah, if you will, of uh, witchcraft trials in the 16th century into the 17th century before this uh, system of belief mostly passes out of Western culture. Obviously, there's still tradition and culture of the supernatural, but not as deep or, or as the belief that, that people have once we get into the 18th, 19th century in these things is not nearly as sincere as it is in the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. So the witchcraft crazes, here we have a, a woodcut by Albrecht Dürer, and actually um, looking at his signature there, uh, I think that this may have been reversed here, this image, the AD is for Albrecht Dürer. But here you see this witch riding backwards on a goat, and goat is of course a symbol of Satan, and this horrible old woman here uh, who's riding off to do something horrible, no doubt. And historians debate today why in the 16th century into the 17th century, there was this uh, witchcraft mania, uh, particularly in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and, you know, it's up to you which explanation you think is the most convincing. Um, at its root level, of course, there's explanation for the unknown. You know, why did my cow suddenly die? Well, you know, gee, that crazy old lady walked by our house the other day and asked for some alms. And when I said no, she walked away muttering. And next thing you knew, my prized cow was dead. Hmm, wonder if that's the, re the reason is she's a witch. Um, you know, the plague sweeps through the town and a healthy child dies and a 
sickly child lives. Well, why is that? Well, you know, maybe there's witchcraft. Um, so people look for an explanation that fits their worldview. They know that Satan is working in the world, at least in their opinion. And so they look for, are there some witches in town? Uh, we also have, as I say, with the Reformation, this religious tension. You have both Catholics and Protestants convinced that Satan is working in this world and trying to deceive people and trying to destroy the righteous and, and the right religion and using these legions of witches and, and, uh, and horrible satanic beings to, to work Satan's will in this world. And there's also just the good old-fashioned scapegoating. You know, something goes wrong, and you look you look for something to blame, someone to blame, and and so there you go. You know, let's focus everyone's negativity on a small group of people or even a single person. And there's even people that look at the witchcraft craze, and they look at records of the weather, and, and they see in different parts of France, for example, um, during one of the witchcraft crazes, there's a very wet year and conditions that are conducive to the growth of a type of fungus on the rye that was grown. The rye is like wheat, it's used for bread. And that that rye, um, when it is infected with that fungus, it's, it's still edible, um, but it can cause hallucinations. And so people might have actually seen people flying through the air and, and animals talking and all kinds of strange things that in their worldview would have been interpreted as um, hallucinations that come, or, or not hallucinations, rather, but uh, actual um, uh, horrific events that, that are perpetrated by Satan. And uh, obviously we know the Holy Roman Empire is a mess in the 16th and 17th century, a lot of religious war. And so um, it's not terribly surprising that, uh, that in this area where there's tremendous tension um, and upheaval, that there's people that are targeted for this, uh, blamed for it. So the people who are accused of witchcraft, um, they tend to be people that are seen as more susceptible to temptation. Um, there's a sense that older people are uh, weaker, not only in body, but in mind and in spirit. And therefore they are more easily tempted by Satan into, uh, into these unrighteous paths. There's also a sense at the time period that women are not only physically weaker than men, but are intellectually and morally weaker than men. And so an old woman is especially prone. She's got that double whammy. And if she doesn't have a protector, if her husband has died, again, this is before any kind of social welfare programs or social security, there's that sense that, well, you know, she might turn to the devil as her new protector. And of course, uh, the weak are always targeted, the poor are always targeted. And there's absolutely no understanding of mental illness. And so uh, someone who claims to see things that other people can't see, well, they're, they're suspect or hear voices that other people can't hear, they're suspect. And evidence, supposed evidence of someone being a witch would be, again, someone's walking along and muttering things that don't make sense to other people. Uh, they might be suspect. When someone is accused of witchcraft, one of the things that's done is they're, uh, they're, they have to strip down and they're inspected and they look for what was called uh, a witch's teat, which would be a mole or a wart. So you have that stereotypical picture of a, a witch, an old woman with a big wart on her nose. That actually goes back to this day. They thought that that's where the, uh, the witch's familiar would come and drink blood. And the familiar, again, is an animal that would be in the uh, Satan in the form of an animal. And this could be a toad or a, a cat or a bat or a, a rabbit or a dog or, or any kind of animal, really. Um, so again, it's kind of a sad picture. You think of some uh, poor old widow and maybe she's got a mild dementia and she has a little pet toad that she's taken in from the garden and uh, it looks very suspicious to people at this time period. So when you combine that with some sort of strange occurrence and uh, you get uh, a recipe for uh, accusation of witchcraft. And once someone is accused, it's it's pretty bad news for them. Uh, it's pretty routine to use various forms of torture to extract a confession. And we know today that uh, everyone cracks under torture. It's just a matter of time. And, and eventually you will say what the torturer wants you to say. And so 
people would be tortured, eventually they would confess. Uh, and then of course, the next step would be, all right, we're gonna, now that we know you're a witch, we know witches don't work alone. There's always a coven of witches, a group of witches. And so uh, the next step is who are the other witches? And so this is where you get this spread of witchcraft accusations throughout society. And in the, uh, in the trial, they would accept what's called spectral evidence. And so people who claim to see things that weren't there that would be admissible evidence. Obviously, in a modern courtroom today, that's not admissible at all. And the end result of these trials is execution. Um, and so there are various methods of execution, hanging or burning, but uh, there's really, um, there's not a happy ending for anyone really who's accused of witchcraft. It's, it's not going to end well. Now, obviously, uh, this declines, this, this disappears, the witchcraft trials go away. And uh, here on the right, I have uh, an image from a book published in England in 1693 about the witchcraft trials in New England. And the reason people in England are interested in this is because it's, it's becoming increasingly rare in England. And in fact, people in England saw the colonies as kind of this backwater that they still had these witch trials. And, and the reason the Salem witch trials stand out so much is because they really are the last of the major witch trials in Western society. Um, there's an English historian named Keith Thompson, and uh, he wrote a book called Religion and the Decline of Magic. And his his idea, which is, I think, a pretty sound one, is that the belief in magic declines because there's a different intellectual um, system that replaces it. Uh, as you get into the 17th century, um, you're getting into the scientific revolution. You're starting to get into people wanting evidence, measurable evidence, uh, in order to sustain their claims. And of course, accusation of witchcraft just don't hold up. Um, you also get in religion, you're getting with the Reformation, you're getting people looking for um, logical arguments to make their case. They're looking to scriptural references to make their case. And, um, and again, that ties into the idea of making a logical argument and being able to do this without resorting to torture and, and uh, and kind of brute force to get people to admit to things that normally people wouldn't obviously admit to doing. And also in the 18th century, in addition to this intellectual change, um, compared to the 16th and 17th century, the, the upheavals of the, the wars of religion and the Thirty Years' War in, in the Holy Roman Empire and uh, the, um, the English Civil War in the mid-17th century, by the 18th century you have um, economic stability, it becomes increasingly rare for there to be famines in Europe in the 18th century due to improved agricultural techniques. Um, there's increasing political stabil stability throughout the 18th century. Um, and so you're less likely to get uh, this sort of disruption and tension that caused people to turn on their neighbors. And you also get a, a greater degree of social stability um, resulting from the, the growth of the middle class in much of Western Europe. Um, people are materially a little bit better off. They're not quite on the edge. And so um, they're a little less inclined to see witches hiding in the background. So eventually these witch trials do disappear and, and uh, the belief in witchcraft fades to kind of a, you know, a Halloweenish superstition kind of thing. People don't actually believe that witches are actively disrupting their lives. And so fortunately, this sad chapter in European history comes to an end by the 18th century. So as always, if you have any questions, uh, certainly um, send me a message and I'll be glad to try and elaborate on anything and uh, help you out. So thanks for listening.